up in the back table. And when it comes, um, feel free to, to get up and, and get your coffee, but let's try to, you know, not everybody get up and go get coffee at once. <laughs> make a mad dash for the coffee. <laughs> um, and what I'm going to do right now is just go ahead and turn it over to Anne, who's going to um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and introduce the panelists. One of our panelists is still en route, but you can still give a bio, and okay. we'll turn it over. Thanks so much for being here. Well, good morning. My name is Anne Hyman. I am the Director of Library Services at Bryan LGH here in town. Uh, the Bryan LGH Medical Center uh, Library, it's the library for the hospital, and it's also the library for our College of Health Sciences. So we serve the nursing and health professions programs, and then we also serve everything from the physicians to the respiratory therapists to the administrators, um, anybody who works in a medical center uses our services. So I am pleased to be here today, um, and I'll be introducing our esteemed panelists and um, kind of moderating through making sure they don't talk too much. So, um, we're going to start with Josie. Josie Rodriguez is the Consumer Outreach Coordinator for Nebraska Attorney General's Office. Josie has worked for the state of Nebraska for 14 years, previously working for the Nebraska Health and Human Services System. Josie's responsibilities include providing information and education on issues of consumer fraud, scams, identity theft, and other consumer protection issues to Nebraska residents. Josie also directs the Senior Anti-Fraud Education Program in which she and senior volunteers across the state inform senior residents and individuals working with seniors about frauds and scams prevalent among the senior population and what tools they can use to guard against consumer fraud. Josie has a Bachelor's of Science degree in Human and Social Service Administration and a Master's of Science in Healthcare Administration. So I will turn it over. All right. <laughs> well, I want to thank Siobhan for inviting me to speak here. Um, when she asked me, I thought, well, it, it's a little bit out of my area, but I did work for Health and Human Services, as she says. Now it's been, gosh, I need to change that because the years just start flying by and, and it's crazy. I've been there for about 18, the state for 18 years I've worked for them. Um, previously with the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, I worked in Lexington. I uh, worked as a social service worker, but then um, my last job with them was with the Office of Minority Health. And what I did there was really work with community agencies, healthcare agencies, and minority populations to further uh, the efforts of minority health. And with our office, we really had to start out um, just from scratch. There, you know, with public health monies that were given, across the state, we were able to open an Office of Minority Health, the third congressional district, and so there was really nothing out there. And so it's kind of, it is about building alliances and working with individuals to try to really get your work done. So that's kind of how um, it, it really rolls over into what I do now. Right now I work for the Attorney General's Office. I work in Consumer Protection. How many of you are familiar with our Consumer Protection Division? A few. You know, it's interesting because um, I think the outreach is all about networking and telling people what you do. It's kind of like we always say, if you have that one minute in the elevator with somebody important, what are you going to say about your program? And I think that that's really what it's about. So um, for those of you that don't know what I do, you know, a lot of people know that our office exists, but they don't know the extent of what we do. One of the major divisions is our Public Protection Bureau. And in that is consumer protection. And what we do is we help consumers fight frauds and scams. There's a lot of individuals that are taken advantage of by bad business practices or different frauds and scams. And so I educate consumers uh, about that and what to do. Specifically, I work with seniors. I do a lot with seniors. And you know they are a target population that is taken advantage of often. I do a lot of presentations at senior centers. I um, actually, it's interesting because I had communicated with Gary before this, uh, this um, panel discussion. And so, as I said earlier, it's all about networking and trying to get those individuals where you can uh, talk to audiences. Part of it also is about finding audiences that are already established. I do a lot, like I said earlier, at senior centers because we know that the seniors are there and they're, they gather there. And so that's an important piece for me about doing that outreach. And I also think that uh, partnering with so many different agencies is important. You know, you don't think about, sometimes we're stuck inside of the box, and I think we need to look outside of the box and see, well, how can I do outreach to more individuals? 
you know, probably at something like this, people maybe have read the agenda and thought, okay, well, why is the, uh, somebody from the Attorney General's office here? And so I'm just going to talk about my experiences and, and how um, I make those contacts, how I get those contacts. I really try to attend a lot of different um, oh, outreach sessions, but also presentations, conferences that are going on, because you may think that somebody isn't really that topic isn't related, but it is. I think it's all kind of like the social piece of what we do. Even though you may work in public health, I think that there's still a piece in there where if somebody is going through a fraud or scam or has lost a lot of money in something, that can affect their overall health and well-being. So I think that any time that we can get our um, consumers information that will help them in whatever aspect, I think, is, is a good way for us to, to go. So I think it's important, as I said, to really not just think about the people in your <laughs> field, but also think about how other area, how other individuals can help. You know, um, I work with Jim Peterson and with how, and Health and Human Services. And I guess I never really thought about how, you know, cancer, you're still in the cancer area, right? How maybe we could do that. But I'm sure that they probably put on different presentations and stuff. We do a lot of health fairs. We're involved in a lot of health fairs as well. And some people think it's not related, but I really do think that it's related to the overall health and well-being of how, um, I guess, people perceive what happens to them and how it affects their health. So um, I've also worked with a lot of different churches and um, community-based agencies. I think that partnering is key, collaboration is key, working with as many individuals as you can. Why reinvent the wheel if there's no need to? I work a lot with the Area Agency on Aging Offices as well because they have individuals that go out to different communities and give presentations. Also like the SHIP program, they go out and give presentations. If I can work with them and build that relationship with those individuals that are going out there, why not tag team and take some time, you know, maybe even if it's 10 minutes, it gives me an opportunity to talk about our program and what we do and how we can help individuals. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about was, you know, being connected with the people that you serve. Oftentimes, you, know, you serve a lot of different populations, and yet I'm not a senior, but I think that it's really being able to talk to them at their level, understand some of the concerns that they have so that they do build that trust and relationship with you because that's what it's about. And with our office, it's also about that integrity. When I talk to people about frauds and scams and they, how they can use our office as a resource, I need to follow up with those phone calls that they make to me. And if they have a concern, help them. It may not fall within our office, but then help them and guide them to where they need to go. So I think it's part about that, because if you're going to do outreach, it's important for you to follow through and um, have somebody trust what you're going to do and do what you say you're going to do. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, flexibility. You know, a lot of people work 8 to 5, and, and sometimes you can't do the outreach to individuals at 8 to 5. I was um, recently at the State Fair, the new State Fair in Grand Island, and, um, you know, it's important to do those types of things and to, to get out to more individuals. We've also even been at a farm and rancher show in Omaha. And it's interesting because people say, what is the Attorney General's office doing here? Are you here to check on us or something? It's like, no. No, you know, that's a population that we usually don't see. And if we can get our information out to them, because they're consumers just like anyone else, it's, uh, it's important too. So try those avenues, see if they work. It may not. You may not get the response that you want, but at least you, you made the attempt to do that. Um, also talking about flexible hours, it's not, like I said, it's not just between 8 and 5. It's sometimes on Saturdays. I work a lot with the uh, um, Hispanic population here in the state as well. And so I do presentations on Saturdays, sometimes on Sundays. So I think it's very important to be flexible. I know that sometimes it, it's hard, but I think that if they see that you're making that effort and in going to them when they can, when they have the time to hear the information, I think that's important as well. Of course, clarity of your goals and objectives is important as well. We all know that. I think that that's a, a no-brainer there, knowing where you want to go and how you're going to get there. Um, another important piece, I think, for me is really knowing the resources that are available, not only in your area, but knowing resources, you know, I'm just saying, like, not in public health, like, the library is a vast, you know, resource where individuals can go and get information. That's why I thought, you know, when Gary called me, I thought that was a great opportunity for our office to get involved with the library, because a lot of people go to the library for information. And if we can have our information there, that's that much, um, 
better and that many more consumers that maybe we'll be able to help now and in the future. Um, our office has worked, worked with a lot of different, um, not only state, but community organizations. We have um, our program, it's this, our Senior Anti-Fraud Education Program. I'm, I coordinate it, but we have many volunteers throughout the state. So that's another opportunity if you have an outreach program is to think about maybe are there volunteers out there that can help me spread the word? Because I'm not sure um, how your programs work, but I know me going across the state, that's, it's, it's too much. It's, it's, you know, our state is, is, very, um, is very vast, and you know how long it takes for me to get from one end to the other. So if you can find people out there that can be your voice in those smaller communities, I think that that's key as well. We do provide training to our individuals, and like I said, we work with uh, SMP, the State Medicare Patrol, and the SHIP program, which is the Senior Health Information Program. And they have volunteers. So if I can find a volunteer that's also interested in spreading our news, that's better for me, and that's more information that I can get out into Alliance or Fall City or all those smaller towns where maybe it'll be harder for me to, to get to. Now, I talked a little bit about being reliable and trustworthy. It's also important to be creative. You know, are there different ways that I can um, bring my message out to the communities? I think so. I think it's important to, like I said earlier, think outside the box. How can we get our message out to different communities? And that doesn't just include um, seniors and, and um, children or youth, but it also includes minority populations. How can I reach those minority populations and let them know about our services and resources? The, panel, um, the individuals here include public health, is that right? From health, where's everyone from? from public libraries, public health, what else is represented? Health and Human Services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hospital libraries. Yes. Um, so if you're from a library and you feel that you know, our information would be important to have out there, let me know. Um, like I said, even public health, I think it's important. I know I did a presentation a couple years ago at the public health um, center in Columbus. So, like I said, it's all, to me, uh, related socially. Let's see here, too. Um, talked about going to where people are already at and meeting them at the time that they can meet. I'm trying to think what else. Is there something else? Have, um, did you bring information, you know, business card or anything? Yes, yes, I do okay. have business cards, yes. We, we, have a, we do have a resource table on the corner there, and so... Um, some yes, and I will. I will bring um, some of our brochures as well, so that you can kind of see. I think it's also important when you're <clears throat> developing information, your resources. When we developed our program for our senior population, we made it in a way where it's oh, how would I better visual for them. We there's a lot of individuals that may have um, macular degeneration, so we did it in large font. So think about those populations that you're working with, and are they going to be able to read your materials if it is in the smaller font? I know we all want to get as much as we can in our materials, but really you need to think about the people that you're serving and are they going to be able to read it and um, access that information. So, do we take questions now? Yeah, or do we, we, have, we have plenty of time for questions. So. Um, I have You know, we can have, gosh, between 200 cases open um, at one time. Yeah, we take a lot of complaints from individuals. I always tell individuals that um, call us. You know, <coughs> if it doesn't fall within our jurisdiction, we'll forward it on to those that it does. Can really, you give us an example of like, something that you've had maybe health-related? Oh, yeah. We have a, a lot of individuals that maybe get um, bills from hospitals or places that they've gone, and they feel that the billing, it's a billing error. If it's Medicare, we may refer it on to the state Medicare patrol if we see there's a Medicare issue there. But if it's not, we help a lot with Medicare billing issues. So if there's an issue you know, with something like that, we can help that way. There's a lot of different things. I'm trying to think if there's another, you know, we may even have a complaint against a company where they're not providing the services that they're supposed to. We may send a letter from our office and just ask the questions, you know, is there, maybe there's a lack of communication between the organization and the consumer. So it's really about communication between the consumer, our office, and the um, organization itself. So those are some of the types of health related. We do get, uh, like I said, Medicare complaints as well. Um, we get some complaints from healthcare 
services, maybe health plans, people that are selling different types of health plans. So I think it's just important for you all to know about the resource because people might come to you, they might come to the public health department. If you're an agency that it, they feel is trustworthy, they're going to come to you with a lot of different things, as many of you may know. You know, not just their specific health-related question being about diabetes or something. They may come to you with other things that come up. They may just have, find one of these fake checks and talk to your receptionist or somebody about it. So I think it's important to know the resources that are out there so that you can help them, which in turn brings them back to you again for everything else. So. How do you, um, how do you find the, like you talked about, and I think it's great, the outside the box, the you know, showing up at the Columbus Public Health. How do, you, how do you get that started, finding those people that you network with? Yeah, you know, like I said, it's important to go to you know, things like this, other events that are available. Networking is, is key. Um, I think, I'm not sure, Gary, how you heard, how you called me. I looked you up on the web. Did you look me up on the web? <laughs> um, I, but I think that there's also an a individual that goes to, our, to the South Omaha Community Care yeah. Council meetings. If there's a, a meeting that involves a lot of different maybe health and human services or social organizations that work socially, I think that's key to be at. In Omaha, there's a South Omaha Community Care Council, and it is um, comprised of organizations throughout South Omaha and Omaha itself, Lincoln, uh, different communities, and they just talk about what their organization does, how they can help consumers, and there you really find a lot of opportunities to speak at. You have the opportunity to you know, give your two-minute elevator talk, and that's where people can hear what your program is about and have the opportunity to ask you, well, can you come out and speak to our organization? What do you do? How can you help our consumers? Things like that. I think the other piece is word of mouth. You know, if somebody hears you speaking uh, at, some, you know, at an event, they like what they hear, of course, they're going to spread that on. We do a lot of uh, senior fairs as well. We have one coming up in Columbus and one in Kearney. I work with a lot of retirement facilities as well. So a lot of it is doing that work on your own, finding those organizations. Um, you know, we have a list of senior centers and just calling, calling, calling them and, and seeing if you can come out and speak to them. I think um, one of the things I'm sure a lot of you have found that is if you go to a health fair, of course it's great to have the interaction with the people that come to your booth, but a lot of times it's the other people in the yes, other booths. Exactly. And that's how you build the, the network. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. Do you have other questions for Josie? I had a question. I was just curious about if there's anything you do about tracking, like if you go to one of these fairs and then somebody calls you because of that fair, I mean, how do you analyze or gather statistics on if that outreach is working? You know, I, I do. I do um, ask them where they heard about our office, and so I try to track that. I track the presentations that we give, how many individuals come. So I think that is important, especially when you're trying to um, clarify your goals and objectives. How am I going to meet this goal? Is it because you know, I, I was, we had an ad in the paper, or was it because we did an outreach session? Right. So yeah, I mean, we, we do track that to keep, okay. to keep track of, are we, you know, when I go to the senior center, am I getting a referral from a senior that's there, maybe visiting from another senior center? Mm -hmm. So we do have evaluation forms as well, and, and we track that as well. Okay, that's so. great. Are there any other? Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of confusion, particularly with seniors, about, um, medications and prescriptions and can I order them from outside the yeah, country and yeah. that kind of thing. Do you, get, do you handle those kinds we of We do. Things? We can offer those types of complaints as well. There are a lot of things that are going on on the internet. You know, there's a lot more individuals using the internet. And I think people are getting so much correspondence by mail too. They just don't know what to, what to, if it's reliable or not. So yeah, we work with consumers and letting them know. And if it does come from outside of the country, be, be wary. We send out a lot of newsletters as well. That's important. We have, whenever we're at an event, we ask individuals if they would like to sign up for our, um, to be on our mailing list. And that will create information that's sent to them on different types of frauds and scams. But yeah, we try to educate them. And, and let me just go, go back a little bit and tell you what our senior program is about. We talk about charity fraud. We talk about, talk about market, telemarketing fraud, investment fraud. We do try to talk about um, internet scams. There's a lot of things that come through the internet, and some of those are the prescriptions. 
you know, they're trying to find ways that they can save money. So if there's a wonderful opportunity out there, they're going to try to take advantage of it. So we do tell them, just be careful what you are getting in the mail. Call us without, you know, before you act on anything, we say, give us a call and let us know because oftentimes they will send that money and they won't get the product or, yeah, and we can sure try to help with that. Those are things, yeah, complaints. I think that we it's did. even a question of knowing what is legal and what is... Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, you know, we can tailor a presentation if, you know, you think it would like to come out. We can kind of tailor it to, if you would like to talk about more health care fraud, we can do that as well. So we can kind of tailor what we got. Last year, our office helped consumers get back over a million dollars, $1.3 million. Now, a lot of people, like I said, they don't even know that our um, consumer protection division exists. And, you know, we're, we're really helping individuals, consumers overall, not just seniors get back a lot of money that, that is lost in either a fraud or scam or bad business practice. And oftentimes people say, well, you know, how could I be ignorant and fall for that? And all of us are potential victims. You know, we don't think about it. And scam artists really are, they're savvy and they can really trick us into divulging information. So I tell individuals, you need to let us know what's going on because we can't help if we don't know what's going on. So, yes. How well do you work within the state government then and other divisions and all that. How, do, how does that all tie together in terms of like policy and all that? Uh, policy? Well, or policy. just just in general too. Yeah. You know, like I said, we collaborate with Banking and Finance, uh, Department of Revenue, um, the Secretary of State. We work with a lot of different state agencies as well as community agencies on, you know, finding the best thing for the consumer. I think that that's the key is how can we help the consumer, be it public health, you know, be it HHS, be it our office, how can we help the consumer? And if there's a, if banking and finance can help better than we can, then we refer it on to them. So we have really good relationships with, you know, the, the FBI, you know, we work with the Consulate of Mexico, we work with so many different agencies, and that's where it's key to go to networking events where you can um, meet these individuals. Because some of you, you know, even the Consulate of Mexico, you may not think that it's public health related, but really it could be. They have, a, they have an area that is about health, health uh, literacy and, and health education. And so that may be um, one contact that you may want to make through that. So, and if that's something that you're interested in, I, you know, I have that contact too. You can sure let me know. But, it's thinking different, thinking outside the box, and how can I, you know, do outreach to different consumers? In fact, the consulate in, of Mexico in Omaha has a clinic, a health clinic, that students at Creighton are are there probably four hours a day, three or four days a week. So yeah, that's I mean, that that is the outside the box piece that Josie brings is. It's amazing to see what these other organizations are really up to, and how can we get involved in that. Exactly. And, you know, and it's not only, um, you know, a lot of people think, well, we can't mix um, government with um, church, things like that. I do a lot of presentations at different um, churches. I think it's important. There, people are there. They want the education. And so, like I said earlier, it's, it's, you have to go to where the individuals are at and really where the need is because a lot of times they bring those concerns to their pastor or different clergy in that church and who can help them. And if they don't know the resources, then how are they going to help their consumers? So I think that it's important to, to find those key people in areas where you think your consumers are going to go to, you know, the library, the churches, consulate, different places where they're going to really take those questions to. And if you're a resource that can help, you need to be on that list. Thank you very you're much. Welcome. That was wonderful. Okay, we're going to move on, and we're going to move on to Gary. Um, Gary, is it Wasden? Yes. I say that, Wasden. Uh, moved to Omaha in January 2010. So, um, welcome. Thank you. New here, <laughs> um, to become the new director of the Omaha Public Library. Uh, prior to Omaha, Gary was the assistant dean of libraries at the University of Alabama and the director of staff development at New York Public Library. Previous positions uh, include serving as director of the Fogelman Library at the New School, and the Head of Access Services at Wesleyan University. Gary has an MLS and an MS in English from Southern Connecticut State University, and a BA in Theater, theater from Augusta State University in Georgia. Uh, Gary was born in Jacksonville, Florida. He's the youngest of the family, fourth child of a Southern Baptist minister father and a school teacher mother. Um, 
In the short time Gary has been in Omaha, he started to identify some key priorities for the library, which include increasing hours in the branches, identifying new strategic partnerships throughout the com community, and a renewed focus on outreach and programs for kids, teens, and adults. So I will turn it over to Gary. Thank you. And first, my apologies for being late. Sorry. <laughs> and then my cell phone going off. Sorry. <laughs> Let that be a warning to you all. And when mine went off, I saw several of you look at your own phones off. I was just doing my part. <laughs> um, and actually, I went, I'm late for somewhat of a good reason. I, I forgot what I wanted to pass out to you guys today, so I drove back to get it. Because <laughs> this is more interesting than me. Um, well, what I, what I thought I'd talk about today, I have one specific project that uh, I wanted to, to share with you that we've completed. Uh, and to kind of talk through a little bit of that. But I also wanted to step back from that a little bit and talk more about why we did it, how we found ourselves in a situation of doing this, um, and how perhaps, you know, in the public library, we're starting to think of ourselves uh, a little differently and playing a little bit different role in our communities, um, stepping maybe a little bit outside of the traditional box that we, um, that we put ourselves in and following up nicely on a lot of things that Josie alluded to about those partnerships that might not be your first sort of logical thought um, of where you, uh, where you envisioned yourself partnering, um, but really comes down to, you know, as Josie kept saying, from her perspective, going to where the people are. From our perspective, we are where the people are, um, and really seeing ourselves uh, as that increasingly becoming a core, a core role of the public library. Um, and I should start out with full disclosure to say that I had nothing to do with any of this because I just got here in January. Um, so um, I will say I and we quite uh, generously, but um, all of the work was done when I got here um, except for the printing. So um, uh, I can't take too much credit for the specific project, um, although I will. Um, but um, again, I think you know this, uh, this is one example of many things that we're trying to do and I think many more things that uh, that we've yet even to think of doing uh, as we think about how the Omaha Public Library fits into uh, its community. So uh, my predecessor in, in her thinking and getting us here was to really start to think about um, the public library really as a community center. So forgetting you know, the books, forgetting the programs, forgetting the things we do every day, of really thinking you know, at, at its heart the public library is you know, its community center. It's the place where people come for many different things, but they come. They come to us physically, they come to us virtually, um, and they do all kinds of things together, all kinds of things individually. Um, it's also, I think, in the same line with that important to think of the library as kind of a, a neutral territory. Um, it's, you know, again, we have kind of the old classics, you know, the, the last bastion of true democracy, the place where um, you won't be judged, at least not openly, um, <laughs> where, you know, whoever you are, whatever you come for there, there's not, there's not a stigma attached. Um, and that's, I, I think, a really uh, something that we all know and we all sort of recognize, but I think it's very important to be very explicit about that with your staff and with the public to think about how incredibly powerful that makes us is that, you know, we're one of the few places that you can come, you know, for whatever reason you have, uh, and it can be a very personal reason that you don't share with anyone, it can be something that you broadcast to everyone. Um, but whatever it is, there's not really anything sort of attached to that. And that comes to place in a lot of different things. One of the more recent ones that we've been working on in Omaha uh, is working with our literacy center. We have a, a, a literacy center of the Midlands uh, based there in Omaha that works primarily with adults. Um, and they str have struggled for many years with, um, with their outreach efforts uh, and with getting, basically getting adults to, to come to them for help. Um, and again, sort of the same embarrassment of, of, you know, of uh, fraud, of being a victim of fraud. The same thing with literacy. There's a, a sort of sense of embarrassment, a hurdle that you have to get past for that. Well, you know, one of the things that we've tried to work with them to recognize is that you know, you guys still do all the work. We're glad to let that happen, but do it in the library because, you know, if I put myself in their shoes, you know, if I'm an adult, if I'm, you know, functionally illiterate, 
I don't want to be seen walking into a big sign with a big banner over the door that says, this person is illiterate. But I will go to the library where nobody knows why I'm there, and I can just kind of set, you know, quietly slip into a classroom and go to a literacy class. Nobody needs to know. And the people that are in there are in the same boat I am. Um, so it makes for a very safe environment. So that puts us in a really good position to work with various agencies around the city to help them deliver their services. Um, and I guess kind of the last piece of that is really ultimately recognizing that when you start, it may seem like a departure from your traditional role in the community. But by the time you get to the end of it, you realize you're really just doing what you've always been doing, and that's just helping connect people with the information they need. Um, and uh, again, sort of, uh, we always kind of, I think, get a little bit upset with uh, you know, our constituents, with our community, with our elected officials, when they focus so much on libraries as books books, books, and we do so much work to sort of push beyond that. But then I think we ourselves sometimes fall into that same trap as well of not realizing how broad our reach is and how broad the role is that we can play. So the approach that my predecessor started and one that I am wholeheartedly continuing is to really step back and look at the city as a whole. And um, what she did was, uh, you know, basically kind of survey what's going on in the city to listen to what our elected officials are talking about, to read the newspapers, um, and just to think, you know, what are the really critical problems, issues, needs uh, in Omaha? Uh, and then to sort of create, you know, in some ways almost a brainstorm list of problems, uh, and then to go through and think, you now what, what role does the library play uh, in making this better and improving this situation? Um, one of the tops of the lists that, uh, that she came up with was um, uh, perhaps, it's a little known fact, I think, outside of Omaha. I certainly didn't know it, but one of our claims to fame uh, is our incredibly high STD rates. Um, and uh, it's astronomically high, I mean, for any city, and, and, and much, much, much higher than the places where you'd expect to, uh, to find this in much, uh, much larger urban areas. Uh, especially troubling in that we are number one in STD rates among young people, <clears throat> and especially young women. Um, so again, a public health issue that has been, that the city has been struggling with for years. Um, and again, a lot of interest, a lot of conversation about this happening uh, among various people, not the library. So conversations between the mayor and city council, public health uh, organizations, hospitals, um, you know, the more sort of what you might consider natural, logical uh, people to be talking about this. Uh, so what the library did was think about, now, now what can we do? How can we kind of get at the table? And to be perfectly honest, we approach these things with a little bit of a selfish attitude, and let's, you know, be frank. I mean, we, want, we, we go into that with wanting to help the greater good, but we also want to go into that thinking, how is this going to benefit the library and what is this going to bring to us? Really important to be explicit about that because we need to get something out of it. I mean, we, we rely on... Um, uh, you know, our meager budgets to, to do incredible things, we need to know that there's going to be some kind of a return on investment for being there. So what we saw is, of course, an opportunity to partner with organizations to help them and to help get the word out, but also to help people see that we can really put ourselves into any situation and be part of a solution for almost any problem that our community faces, uh, because we have just, uh, you know, uh, you, you probably couldn't put any, any problem on the table that there isn't some small role that a library can play, if it's nothing more than helping an agency reach its potential audience. Um, you know, for us, again, where do we benefit from that? Well, the more that we can really weave ourselves into our communities, into our cities, into the, the, the population that we serve, you know, quite frankly, the harder it is to get them to unweave us. Um, we want to be so completely integrated with our communities that it, it's, it's a no-brainer, that you just, you know, you see, well, if we were to cut the library's budget, it's not just that they couldn't buy more books, it's not just that they couldn't buy databases, not that they would reduce their hours, but there would just be this domino effect around the city of other agencies that it would affect. 
for us, that's great. It's a win-win situation. It puts us in a situation to really show that for every dollar you put into this library, you're helping just an inordinate number of agencies and departments around the city, government, private, uh, philanthropic. So we really approach this as an opportunity to, to really find a way to strengthen the library and to position the library for success. Now, getting back to the SCD issue, um, you know, this was one that the, the city, as I mentioned, had been struggling with and really thinking about, you know, what can we do for this? Our role really to come into play with this was, was partly an educational role and partly an informational role of just kind of helping to get the word out. And we were sort of looking at, you know, what are the ways that we can do that? Again, we have the captive audience and we decided we would target young people. Um, one of the first sort of pushbacks in, in thinking about this idea was, well, isn't that, you know, shouldn't the schools be the place? If you wanted to reach, let's say, every, you know, teen in Omaha, wouldn't the schools be a much more logical place to do that since, yes, many of them come to the libraries, but not all of them, and most or all of them you could probably reach through the school system. That's partly true, and certainly the schools are, are doing things and are engaged in this. But again, this comes back to that kind of neutral territory. And you can take the sort of exact same thing, uh, do it in the school system and do it in the library and have very different results. Um, young people uh, come to us with a, a slightly different frame of mind, so to speak. Uh, and they tend to be a little bit more receptive to things that they're learning in a library setting than what they're learning in a school setting. Uh, we're finding that now our sort of newest uh, uh, venture that we're working on is cyberbullying. Uh, and this is coming up quite tremendously because, of course, this is a, an issue that's growing and growing in significance, getting a lot more press. Um, and we do have uh, an organization based in Omaha that's dealing with cyberbullying. They've been working exclusively through the schools. And what we found, what we talked to them about, and we're already finding is that they're just taking the work that they're doing through the schools, essentially doing the same thing in the libraries, but they're getting such a different response from the young people in attending. Um, you know, I can sit through, and they do. I do a lot of this through theater. They do uh, little uh, little shows that they create. Um, you know, a kid will sit through that in their school auditorium with their peers, and yeah, some will pick up on something, some will pick up on another. But you do the same thing in kind of that public library setting, which is a little more fun, a little more relaxed, a little more mixed audience, and a completely different experience for them. And they walk away with very different skills. So again, it's it's showing and demonstrating that the library can in some ways more effectively, but certainly as effectively, help to get these messages out. Um, you know, with the STDs, again, it's a, it's a topic that has some sensitivity uh, involved in, in talking about, um, again, putting it in as safe a territory as possible was really kind of what we were looking at and something to help kind of get that message out multiply. Um, so what we uh, came up with was an idea to um, uh, to write a grant and, and raise uh, funds, a very small grant, uh, to produce uh, a comic um, about STDs that was aimed at young people, specifically aimed at young women, um, that you know didn't do a whole lot to, to sort of push information out there, but just more or less to kind of raise the topic and get them thinking about it and to share just a tidbit of information and a little bit about where they could go to get more information. Uh, so we actually wrote two small grants um, and produced uh, the comic. I'm just going to pass this around here for you to see. This was kind of uh, one piece of a larger thing. And I'm sorry, since I ran back, I hope I think I got enough. But if I did run out, let me know at the end, and I'll, I'll get more copies to you. So what we wanted to do was to produce something very light, very simple, uh, and in a medium that would appeal to young people. Um, so we produced this, this very short little comic. Um, and uh, we worked with a lot of different agencies to, to coordinate this, uh, this effort. Uh, we, we used the grant funds to hire a, a script writer to write the text uh, and an illustrator to design uh, and, and draw the images. Uh, then we worked with Douglas County Health Department, of course, to uh, basically help inform us to talk about the information, the need, and what we needed to get across. Uh, but then also on the flip side to help us distribute this and help get this into people's hands. Um, we worked with the school systems. Um, this was distributed last year and again this year uh, through the school system. To date, I think so far we've, we've distributed 30,000 
uh, and we're printing additional copies now uh, to go out this year to the school system. So again, working with these partners to help get these into people's hands. And then, of course, we have them in the libraries uh, as well, as well, where kids can pick them up, or we have them uh, available you know, at our information desk, as well as in programming that's, that's targeted to teens. Um, a, a sort of another, uh, another little tidbit, I guess, that, that puts us in a good situation to help is that we also have, in addition to having this really great access to the teens themselves, we also have really strong connections to their caregivers, to their parents, their guardians, um, you know, their siblings, to their sort of extended network around them uh, in, a, in a way that the schools don't. Um, so we can sort of simultaneously reach out directly to the young people, but also do the outreach to the parents, to the caregivers, to the others that are in their lives and sharing their lives with them. Uh, and that's, again, a kind of another role that something like this plays. Even though it's written for one audience, we're really uh, making a conscious effort to get into other hands as well so that you're either hearing it from your librarian, your mother is bringing this home and putting it in your hands, your teacher is giving this to you, uh, the, the clinics are giving this to you, so that you're, you're almost bombarded with it. But at, the chances are that at some point, someone will put this into your hands and you'll get this information. Um, it's, you know, when you kind of think about just this impact and, and interesting, um, the, the question that came up uh, earlier about, you know, really measuring and, and how do you measure, um, you know, the effectiveness of this. You know, I have to be quite frank that I, I'd say probably we can't. Um, and I'm okay with that. I kind of made my peace with that. Um, it's, it's the kind of thing that we can certainly demonstrate that we've gotten it into people's hands. Uh, but as far as demonstrating, did it make a difference? Obviously, we can look at STD rates, and we certainly hope they go lower. But I don't think we could get to a point of pointing that this was the reason. We can, you know, we can assume that it certainly played a small role in it. Um, but there are so many efforts going on by so many different agencies, it's really hard to tease this out. So I, I think we kind of went into it almost just taking it for granted that it's for the greater good and that it would have some impact. Um, and it was a, obviously a, a relatively small investment, um, so we can kind of assume that, it, that it's doing help. Um, and some of the other, uh, you know, little pieces that sort of went along with this, we're having a little better luck with managing uh, the, the metrics and to determine um, the success of it. So, you know, this was one piece, but it was kind of part of a bigger picture. And what we've tried to do is uh, develop sort of spin-offs of this uh, that reach uh, other audiences in other ways. Um, one of the first things we did also with the grant funding was to produce a public service announcement uh, that uh, aired in April on our NBC affiliate in Omaha. Um, and basically the same artist, the same kind of a cartoon uh, with the same artist working on it, same basic information with the contact uh, information there. So that aired uh, over a month. Um, and for that, it, there were some opportunities to measure success on a slightly small scale. Uh, with that um, ad, at the very end of the ad, it provided the uh, contact information that you see on the back uh, for the Douglas uh, County Health Department. And what we were able to do was basically to work with them to see if there was any significant increase in the number of phone calls. And there was. Uh, it was great to see it, and you could sort of measure it as that, you know, the commercial would play. Uh, and obviously we had a schedule from the TV station to see when the commercials were airing so that then uh, Douglas County Health Department could monitor their calls to see if, you know, there was any correlation. And you could see that, you know, if a commercial aired at 8 o'clock, that at 8.05, you know, there were phone calls coming in. Um, so that was really helpful to see that people saw it. Um, that was, uh, although it was written for kids, again, um, for the commercial, we tried to aim it a little higher, more towards adults. Um, who were looking for information possibly for their kids, possibly for themselves, um, uh, but again, sort of gearing towards the parent caregiver role. Uh, so that was, again, nice to sort of see that that came up with some results. Um, and then the sort of third piece of this is programming around it and looking at programs that we can do throughout our branches that again help to educate and, and inform. And that's bringing in you know, various agencies to talk about various things. Some of them are aimed towards uh, adults. Some of them are aimed directly towards the young people. Um, we generally don't, um, 
you know, it's it's the tricky part there comes in sort of promoting it and even in coming up with a title because we don't call it, you know, the STD clinic. Um, but, you know, coming up with just kind of a way of sort of like teen issues um, um, that talks about a lot of different things, obviously. Um, but this is sort of one piece that gets pushed out there. And again, creating that safe environment where teens can come in uh, and talk um, and all of this is kind of predisposed on having, uh, you know, a great teen librarian or teen specialist that has already developed a trusting relationship with the young people that they serve in that community uh, so that, first, they're comfortable coming, uh, and second, they're comfortable talking, sharing, asking questions. Um, again, a really great opportunity to partnership. You know, we're not the experts in this, um, so we'll bring in someone who is an expert and who can answer those questions what they bring is the knowledge, what we bring is the trust. So, you know, we have our great teen specialist in there that, you know, the kids have a relationship with, they know them, they know that whatever they say is going to be confidential because they've built that trust over the last couple of years. Um, and there's kind of an immediate buy-in. That opens the door for the, the content expert to be able to deliver their message uh, in a way that's going to be much better received uh, than it would otherwise. So we've had a lot of success with that. We've been uh, we've been doing those uh, for the last two years. Um, we you know we do sort of your typical things that you do to get teens to come to programs. Um, we have a small team budget that we use to buy pizza and drinks. Um, we do kind of after school events, so they're they're sort of targeted towards the after school market coming in. Uh, we've done some very specialized ones that target homeschool kids. Uh, who so often get left out of this because they don't sort of fit into the natural flow of after-school activities. Um, so it's been, again, very successful with that. Again, we're able to measure uh, impact in part by attendance, in part by trying to capture the stories that come back, um, you know, which sometimes are very, very small but incredibly powerful. And it may just be six months later, a team coming in and telling where the librarians, you know, that class really helped me, uh, and maybe saying nothing more uh, or elaborating in any great detail, and you have to infer perhaps what the details are, but you know at least that somehow you reach that person um, and really trying to sort of capture that data and collect that information so that we can then in turn kind of demonstrate that this was a good investment uh, and that it is paying off uh, in the communities. I think, you know, beyond that, again, stepping, you know, back up a little bit is uh, the sort of process of using this kind of model is an opportunity for looking more broadly at these kinds of issues. And again, you know, this, this relates to everything, and that's kind of what led me to contacting Josie again. But this idea of, of fraud, um, you know, looking at crime, uh, you know, looking at all the issues that are out there, and again, just figuring out now, where do we fit in? You know, what's the role we play? Sometimes it's a big role. Sometimes it's a little role. Sometimes, quite frankly, it's just making sure that organizations know we have meeting room space that they can use for free. Um, but it's just kind of inserting ourselves and stepping up and being a little bit more aggressive at going out and, and Googling people like you um, to, uh, to find out, you know, who's out there, um, you know, who's doing it. Um, uh, there's just, you know, there's an infinite, infinite uh, numbers of opportunities for partnerships like this uh, and, and to kind of help make these connections. Um, the sort of future life of this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're reprinting this now. Uh, we're also... Um, uh, printing it in Spanish uh, to make it available to, um, um, again, uh, in a limited number, partly for the parents. Most of our kids, that we obviously have a large Spanish-speaking population in Omaha. Most of the kids are, are fine with English, but their parents often are not. Uh, and we want to make sure that, again, this is approachable to their parents as well. Uh, so we are producing a, a number of Spanish uh, language materials that we can distribute uh, through places like the Mexican Consulate uh, and through our, our libraries as well. So I'll stop with that very long rambling <laughs> sentence and uh, open it up to any questions, comments, things you have. Yes? I've got one. Um, actually, I met with the Literacy Center uh, a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and met one of the grandstanders. This is perfect. Yes. Yeah, not actually my branch. And we were talking about your comic book and wondering whether you had plans to put it online. Um, we do. We um, we produced a – what there's two sort of pieces to that. One is – just the sort of static comic, which we do have a digital version of it, and um, we we have it online now. We haven't we're we're doing some modifications of our website 
uh, which we hope to have finished next week. So the sort of static version will be linked to from there. Uh, the commercial, um, I think, probably has the potential to have even greater impact online because it's a little more interesting to watch. Um, that we have on our YouTube channel right now, and again, the, the sort of second iteration of our website, which uh, we'll have done shortly, is going to have a direct link out to these, um, these um, basically to these YouTube video clips, of which this, uh, this is one. I just have a yes. comment. I'm glad you talked about listening for the stories. I think sometimes we forget about the value of anecdotes. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, as, as kind of bureaucratic <laughs> health workers sometimes we say, well, that's only one story. How do we know, you know what was the full impact? But I think you're so right in that sometimes one story can be so compassionate right. that it's, it carries the feeling and it carries other things that we can't otherwise measure. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, really that's, it is right. And it's, it's a shift in focus for us. It's something that I bring from New York Public Library, which was kind of beaten into us about the importance of stories and, and has been so successful for them. We're just starting to do it. But you're exactly right. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's the, the fact that I can show you a list of statistics and charts and you know, that's what we've relied on, you know, gate counts and circulations and those kinds of things, which are still important. And we still obviously look at those and, and more or less just make sure that they're going up. Um, but one story means so much more than that. And we're really, really trying to capture those more and more. Um, all of our branches now have a flip camera. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is, uh, you know, and, and obviously in STD case, probably not something you want to film a kid talking about their STDs. <laughs> but uh, in other instances, you know, what they're doing is when somebody comes in and says, and obviously just coming off of summer reading, uh, this was a big time to do this. And when somebody comes in and says, you know, my kid has always hated to read, and this year they really got hooked, and now they're reading, and he's already ahead of his class in school. It's just to kind of say, wait just a minute, would you mind just saying that, you know, here on this flip camera? And nine times out of ten, they're all thrilled to do it. And obviously we have a little waiver that they sign that we can use it. And we capture that little story because with that one little thing, I can do so much more than that, the piles and stacks of reports that I have um, because I can show that a life was changed. It doesn't matter that 30,000 people came to the library, but it does matter that someone's life is different and is and doing better in school. belongs to a or somebody else. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It hits the heartstrings. Yeah, yeah, it's a face, it's right, right. It's real. It's real. Yeah. Any other questions? How many, how many libraries are there in the world? Twelve. I just want to thank you for bringing that out, um, that the use of the library is um, great value to reach out to people because I do cancer outreach and we don't always think of those things. I mean, we do in the general sense, but not in a specific sense of using our own cancer screen. So I appreciate it. Good. Yeah, it's important. And I think, you know, it's the kind of thing that sometimes, like when I talk to my staff about it, it's internally it's somewhat a duff factor because it's you know we always have been and we've always been willing to do this but I think we've always we've been a little bit more passive about it and we've expected you guys to know about it and to come to us and so I think we're just turning the tables a little bit more and saying no we have to go out uh, and educate we have to tell you we have to promote this we just have to be more active about it that you know we're there and can work with you We're going to do a brief tape change. It's going to take about a minute before we uh, turn it over to Nick. So it'll be just a few more. And the coffee seconds. did show up. I don't know. It's delicious. Also on the, on the table are handouts for um, both of the classes that will be offered. We're sure, we hope that you can all stay through the whole day, but in case you have to leave at any point, make sure you take the handouts with you. And Marty, I don't think you introduced yourself, really. Uh, no, Marty would be, I think I know many of you, but just a couple of announcements. If you haven't already been out the restroom, they're over there in that hallway. Obviously, we've got coffee for you here. Um, I think we'll do introductions perhaps after our panel because we're broadcasting this and it's broadcast live. So we wanted to start right on time, make sure we stuck with our schedule. But we do want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know each other. So those will be important parts of our components. 
the other thing that I'll mention is our class, we do have the option of taking our class in a computer classroom, but there are only 12 workstations. So we would either have to double up or we can stay in this classroom and, you know, project our information on, on the front. So we're going to give you the opportunity to vote on that. So be thinking about that and we'll do that after this panel is over. Okay, great, thanks. All right, I'm going to um, introduce Nick to you. Um, Nick Butler is here from Missouri this morning. Um, his healthcare career spanned 30 years. He's uh, covered a broad spectrum of experience and expertise in both public and private sectors, in academic, hospital, corporate, and volunteer settings. Um, he started as a nursing assistant in neurosurgery unit at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center, where it's where he developed an understanding about the importance of communication and teamwork in direct patient care. After receiving a BA in Fine Arts, Sociology, and Religious Studies at the University of Colorado, designed to explore the role of cultural expression on social values and behaviors, he became involved in large-scale social survey projects at the University's Institute of Behavioral Science, where he studied delinquency and violence and analyzing media literacy and media violence. Uh, there he was able to directly interact with severely mentally ill patients to address mental health services and Medicaid reimbursement while employed as a field interviewer for the University of California's Berkeley School of Public Health. This also involved data management and database administration, uh, which led to private sector jobs with health insurance companies, uh, Pacific Care and United Health Healthcare, with efforts on quality improvement and claims analysis. After years in this industry, Nick shifted to the provider side and worked for the University Physicians of MU to oversee aspects of reimbursement and revenue management through analysis of denied claims. All of these experiences have allowed a holistic view of health in our society, especially when being a patient and consumer of health services. With the near completion of an MS in organization management from Regis University, Nick intends to apply all of his life's endeavors to the realization of meaningful public health policy through engagement of community, social institutes, and people. His work with the Missouri Center for Health Policy on Health Literacy and his current affiliation with Health Literacy Missouri through the MU Masters of Public Health program represent the culmination of a pathway to, what, to see wellness expressed as the true destination of health. So, I think Nick's going to have just a wealth of things to talk about, so I will turn it over to you. Well, it's interesting to hear that. <laughs> all that. I, was I mean, very, I had to read it all because I was so impressed. <laughs> I've been well, you know. I mean, I'm at a certain age where I've done a lot of things in my life and in my career. My career has been. The, the point of that is, is that my career has been all over the place, but mostly in health-related activities. From, you know, working with well, being you know, direct patient care as a nursing assistant to. Um, working for big insurance companies, HMOs, you know, and then working for the, the provider side, helping them get their revenues and all that. So um, the culmination of, of all that into what I'm doing right now is, uh, it just seems perfect. And, and I work for Health Literacy Missouri. All those names, you might have, might have got kind of lost in all those names. But right now, I'm working for Health Literacy Missouri. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a bit. And uh, it is through MU, though. I'm on a contract with this nonprofit, HLM, through MU, the Masters of Public Health program. Um, I think it's interesting that, you know, I'm here from Missouri, and, it, and you know, it kind of brings a regional flavor to a lot of this. And I know that the National Libraries of Medicine are set up regionally. I just want to say a couple things about uh, this concept of regional, too. I mean, we're all kind of focused in our, our everyday lives, too. But... Um, and I think that we need to stay there, but we need to kind of look up and see the, this larger regional st structures, like even, you know, geographically. There's a lot of similarities in a lot of the rural areas between Nebraska and Missouri, I'm sure that, some similarities in the urban areas. Um, one important thing is that the health bill that, that's been passed and a lot of the money that's appropriated in that health bill is about plain language and communication. I mean, that, there's real money to be had uh, for our activities from that level. So, and and uh, the reason I, I bring that up is because there's a real emphasis in that health bill on regional activities. So if coalitions, like if states get together or regions across borders, um, 
many of the uh, health and human services at the federal level, their regions are, you know, go across borders. So this is an important point about this regional activity because it can draw dollars down to regional activities, which can then be put out. So keep your eyes open for interpretations of the health bill. I, I have not read it. I have a lot of people, a lot of analysts that do that for us. So and, and hopefully we can find that clear information uh, moving forward. Um, how many people have heard of the term health literacy with a show of hands? Okay, that's that's a pretty good percentage. I don't know, maybe about half. Uh, that's actually a better percentage than when I present uh, health literacy to like physicians or other health professionals a lot of times, seriously. Uh, and I, I attribute that to the fact that many of you are in, in you know, libraries or communications um, and you deal with media literacy. And I'm not going to get into media literacy today. I just want to throw that out this plug that um, uh, I think as stewards of media literacy, librarians and, and others and educators, um, that is probably one of our biggest barriers that we have right now is people understanding the media messages or the, the information that they get. And so I have framed um, health literacy, and we'll talk a little bit more about that since some of you haven't heard that term, but uh, which is basically the ability to find, use health information for your better health or for well-being. And it's not just the individual, it's institutions too. Doctors need to, you know, talk more, less with jargon and so forth. That's all part of health literacy is to get to that communication part. But I see health literacy as a subset now of media literacy. I always kind of thought of it the other way around, like, you know, you need a little media literacy to do this health literacy. But I really think that, you know, when we come out with health messages, um, through whatever channels, um, we still have that barrier of the corporate media environment, commercials, TV, now social media. So, I mean, something like this is, is really a great idea. It kind of cuts through a lot of that. So we need to, to think of it in those terms, too. So I'm really glad that libraries are getting more engaged in health literacy. And I'll tell you a little bit more about our organization and how libraries are involved with that. Um, ultimately, Health literacy is, is really just a mindfulness activity is the way I see it, which is just if you're a patient and a doctor in a room together, you know, you need to come to an agreement. I mean, everyone understands and doctors can use techniques like asking, what will you tell your family when you get home? And that's called teach back. So there's all these techniques in health literacy to kind of get to this point. Um, how many people, okay, given that kind of real brief definition of health literacy, and you can find, if you Google health literacy, you're going to find there's a ton of information. Over the last decade, it's really grown, and right now it's, it's taken off as evidenced by Health Literacy Missouri, which is, you know, a new nonprofit. But um, how many people have experienced some, some barriers in communication with your health care provider or with your insurance company or know somebody that has? Okay. I mean, it's a universal thing, right? So, um, right, and so knowing that um, um, the state of Missouri through a private foundation called the Missouri Foundation for Health, which is, I don't know if, if you know about private foundations, but this was a uh, previous uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they had like, they covered 84 out of the 115 counties in Missouri, and when they went for profit, the, the state government required they set up a private foundation as kind of like a catchment for all the, you know, the, uh, the underserved that the Blue Cross Blue Shield used to have. So now there's this foundation. The Missouri Foundation for Health, lucky for us in Missouri, is um, really, I think it's the second largest health foundation funder in the country. It's huge. And they have a lot of assets. I mean, it was a very successful St. Louis-based, uh, you know, insurance company. So... Um, but within that program, uh, programming group, uh, you know, they did a lot of assessments of the state. And health literacy, that concept of health literacy, uh, emerges as a really important topic for them to start funding. So uh, three to four years ago, they funded a, uh, the Missouri Health Literacy Initiative. And um, that was an interesting exercise, too. That, that, uh, they uh, put together three resource centers that were based in universities. Uh, one was the Washington University, St. Louis University collaboration, and they, they were really good at um, a lot of 
public health communications and all and research. So they were all researchy. Then then the AHECs, and many of you know about AHECs, were brought in uh, through Missouri State University in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, they were they brought with them some of the library expertise and helped start developing the resources, health literacy resources, um, and, and a website uh, interface for searching and all that. And I'll tell you more about that later too. This can all be found on healthliteracymissouri.org. That's you know go go explore that and you'll see the the resource inventory there. And the third uh, resource center was the the uh, University of Missouri. In Columbia, and that's primarily uh, how I got involved. I hired onto that job. I had been working at University Physicians, but uh, so you know that university has the, the school of medicine, and it had like all the provider pieces. So you see, there's and and plus the Center for Health Policy that got the grant at MU, which is where I was hired onto. Uh, you know, we bridged a lot of organizations throughout the state. So it was really a good collaboration of resource centers plus the uh, Missouri Foundation folks actually sat in on some of the steering too. So it was a, a pretty statewide effort to begin with. So um, I, I won't say too much more about that. Uh, you can find the history of all that on the, the website if you're interested. Uh, many activities were um, were uh, launched during that time. There was a, now, now three years later uh, as this was the, the plan was to launch this whole thing as a separate nonprofit, kind of to break it off. It's still seeded by Missouri Foundation for Health a lot. We have to kind of start finding our own revenue source now. That's the trick. That's why I keep talking about funding, you know. But um, many of the products and services that were developed are very interesting. There's, um, you know, we do simulations with doctors. Uh, we have like health literacy standardized patients they call them. Many physicians go through these thing, you know, clinical simulations it is part of their schooling. Well we got a health literacy case in there so it helps the, the, uh, the doctors speak more plain language to patients. We do that actually with community doctors too. We've taken it out so that's in our toolkit. Um, we have we flipped that a little bit. We have a really great community uh, workshop called the standardized physician or really it's a, that's what we call it internally. It's straight talk with your doctor. And we can get groups, you know, like diabetes support groups, parents as teachers, any community group that's interested in this, um, have medical students come in and be the, the doctor. So they play, that's a role play there, and then we help uh, people in the community understand that you can ask your doctor, what are you talking about? Or, you know, or ask for those kinds of feedback, you know, and it's, so it's a very nice workshop. So we have a lot of workshops, products and services, the library stuff, um, and, and it's all out there now. Now it's time to, like, move forward now that it's all put together and uh, and over the years I had been tasked uh, in my role with just kind of more like core operations so I worked a lot with community groups getting the word out one of the main um, aspects of Health Literacy Missouri in the grant years was to um, fund community organizations for health literacy interventions there was a huge part of that money was set aside to fund these um, uh, community-based projects. And, the, and I was lucky enough enough for um, our area in the mid-Missouri and, and so forth, I, I was the contact person. So I got to work with a lot of community groups who were like, oh, money, let's, let's write a grant. So you know, we wrote many grants. Um, and I'll briefly touch on what some of those uh, demos are. Um, the, the preponderance of them are in St. Louis, of course. I mean, there's a, you know, kind of a St. Louis bias to this whole thing. We're trying to say, no, there's also, you know, rural and the rest of the state. But, um, <laughs> And Kansas City's not included because that was not in that Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield area. They have their own foundation that we have to partner with now too to really fill out the state. But anyway, some of the demonstration projects in the urban areas were like, you know, working with Urban League, pharmacies, just all sorts of stuff. And, and again, I, I urge you to look at the website because I think there's a description of a lot of the demos now. And there's like 31 of them right now. 31 staggered over these three years. So now my new job at Health Literacy Missouri is community outreach. And um, I'm still working at MU, but it's a contract with them. But now I have to figure out, okay, now there are all these products and services. There's all this great energy. How do we um, get it out to the community, to people, how, how they need it? And, you know, there's all these demonstration projects are going. They've got their evaluations going on. How do we, we stay, we have to stay engaged with them now and take the best practices uh, as we go out into the communities and, and just do this. To me, as I talk about it, I'm starting to get overwhelmed. <laughs> I go through this every day thinking about all we have to do because, you know, we don't have a huge staff yet. That's why partnerships are, are ultimately the way to go here. 
Um, many of the demonstration projects, you know, are based on the community-based participatory research CBPR model, which is, you know, that's I feel like what we have to do to go out when we look for new opportunities to to um, engage the community. But um, I, I would like to th th some of these are personal opinions now coming out, but I think it's kind of um, verified out there by funders too. They're starting to see that a lot of the funding that's coming down to these projects gets to the community organization level and then you know usually through academics if you notice that Health Literacy Missouri was initially you know it was all universities and so it had a real academic bent. and so you get uh, this is very typical these days is that a uh, Academics have a project, a great project. I mean, it might be based on a little bit of research, and it might be based on you know a real desire to help people. But it goes in. Uh, they partner with communities. The funding comes in. The the program. You probably are all familiar with this scenario. Uh, the funding lasts for two or three years, or maybe there's a little bit of success, and then the funding you know is gone. The academics go back, write their papers, get promoted. The community's going. Where's yeah. our program? That this I'm seeing more and more all the time, and and now it has created a very serious barrier. Um, uh, when when I work with a couple of the demonstration project partners, to uh, we said we have an idea, social media in the rural areas. Let's let's talk about health literacy on Facebook, and so we went into this really rural community county, and they already had they already had kind of a coalition going based from MU Extension. You know, the Extension Services were in there doing some some nutrition stuff so I thought this is great we got ready partners uh, we can apply for this and we pitched the idea and and they're like no we don't we don't want to do this and you know everyone's astounded or like if you even come in with a smoking cessation program into a community into an inner city urban neighborhood they're like been there done that you know we use a, we take all our time and you know you're hearing this a lot so I guess I'm, I'm going down this path just a little bit to say that true community uh, based participatory research really has to be more about putting your own ideas aside. I know you have all these great programs and I have all these great programs, but you really got to sit down with people first in the community and not even the community organizations kind of get you there. Try to get down even, because that's a layer too, to get down to the grassroots level and just hear what's really on people's minds. That's why I always start off a lot of, the, of meetings with, um, and I didn't ask you guys, but um, like what are your health literacy stories? And you just have people start talking about it, and you know they they might not understand really what health literacy is. I, I try not to use that actually; that's more confusing in the in most cases. So uh, then you start getting the ideas of what uh, people want to do, and, and then you can see if you can you can line up your resources and your partners around that. That's the challenge, because um, it might not match what you had in mind when you went in in the first place. So just be open to that. Um, how, how much time do I have? About five more minutes. Okay. I'll just uh, I'll just give a little anecdote to, to finish up then of, of going into a community. This was um, kind of a mix of both, really getting into the grassroots, but also coming in with an idea, <laughs> pre pre planned idea. Um, there's a little town in Missouri, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, called Milan. It's it's been there forever, you know. Um, then a hog processing plant opened up. Do you know Milan, Teresa? From the days when they had no rental houses. <laughs> the hog processing plant opened up. Now we have now one third of the town is now immigrant uh, Mexican workers, and um, and there's a lot of health problems. There's no resources, nothing. You know, I don't even really know about the, the library, if there's a library there. I don't know that. I don't remember a librarian at the table. Anyway, um, there's also, um, how many people have heard of Canyon Ranch Institute? Any? A few people. Well, that's, uh, see, that's a spa down in Arizona, but it's, but they do this, uh, this uh, life enhancement program, and a lot, it's, there's a lot of health literacy in it, uh, you know, but it's also, you know, it's nice. It's a nice spot. You, got, you can go there and spend a week and spend a lot of money. Well, people started to see that even you know the, the very affluent were coming out with a changed perspective on their attitudes about health and, and their understanding of health issues. 
So um, they spun off an institute, and, and they're trying to replicate this now in underserved populations. It's not always like a weak spa thing, you know, but it's <laughs> what, they, what they do is they, the model is to take providers from a small town like Milan. And this actually, this is a demo, demonstration project that got funded, not without some, some arm twisting. Because a lot of people are saying, oh, what, what if you hear, uh, well, let me finish. So the idea is to take uh, the providers, send them to Canyon Ranch in Tucson, Arizona, go through this life enhancement program, and then bring it back to the community. And so that's what they did. These, this whole team of providers up in Milan went, went there and, and came back to start replicating that model up in uh, Milan. The, the snag was a lot of people saying, what, what if the newspapers got a hold of that one? You know, <laughs> Missouri Foundation Rail sends doctors to spa. But, you know, we, we worked through all that. Anyway, but that was, uh, I, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because the idea was there for Canyon Ranch to come in and work with Health Literacy Missouri to find a rural setting to try this. And uh, we tried a few, and they, and they just did not bite. You know, it's like outsiders, whoa, you know, you get that a lot. Me, I, I'm really kind of imposing sometimes, too, and I can really get that a lot. And, and then you say the word health literacy, and it's like you lost everybody. But we sat down with um, representatives from Health Literacy Missouri and Canyon Ranch sat down with a lot of uh, – people from from Milan and, and there was we had some connections to get all these players around the table and so we started you know public health department the local gymnasium owner um, grocery store owner you know people like that it was at that level we just started talking about the life enhancement program and what it would be like if it came through and uh, long story short it's just you know that was a, a good way to approach it we did that even before we put the first word down on on paper about for a grant so I really like that. That's a great example of how to do it. Um, uh, universities are struggling now with a lot of federal dollars be, or their translation programs from clinic to, to community because they're not engaging the community correctly. So that, that's, I think that I want that to be really one of the largest takeaways besides all these, these great partnerships we can build at a regional level is that grassroots work is, is hard, um, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do it. You know, it's not like you know, it's not like someone can say, "Go out and do community engagement." You know, you have to be there. You have to know people. So this is—it's so important to just leverage all your relationships. Get down. I mean, it might not even be someone that works at the public health department or a community-based organization. It might be that that what some people think is that wacky person that's always at the meetings but gets things going somehow. That I mean, those are the people we want to talk to also. So. Um, Wish me luck as I do this. <laughs> anyway, any questions? Well, I wanted to, I'm not sure that everyone does know about the AHEX in Nebraska, the Area Health Education Centers. There's one in the states divided into Mohawk, Beatrice, Columbus, Grand Island. Grand Island. Um, sorry. Um, and then um, the Scottsbluff. And then there's an urban. And Shadron, I think. And then. The urban AHEC is a partnership between Creighton and University of Nebraska Med Center. And they're great resources. So if you don't know the AHEC in your part of the state, they, the Area Health Education Center, they're trying to, they do two things. They try and get kids interested in health careers, big, really important job. But then they do health education as well. So they're a really excellent resource. And they're still very involved in Missouri. Um, not all the AHECs, but a few of the AHECs uh, have direct contracts, such as I do with Health Literacy Missouri now, to continue that health re that health literacy resource. So go to the to the Health Literacy Missouri website and look, you know, try search it, search, search the database. It, it's not perfect yet; everything's pretty new. But the AHECs are, are definitely very important partners. Can you find the information on the AHEC online? Yes. And and you also have Marty and and. Uh, information and Terry when Terry and Marty are teaching they great resources just if you can't find anything you've got our and I used to be a former oh, yeah. Yeah. librarian so anything you want me to hunt down on these handouts um, my contact information I sure hope it is oh, I've got cheers. and then I've got I'm with the University of Nebraska Med Center now so I'm one of the librarians up there in a previous life I served I trained university physicians in Missouri as a community member, they hired me because I lived in the community. Talking about getting the community 
relationships. They just found me and said, you will stay in your 5,000 person community and you'll train a thousand people. There you go. Like, okay, fine. <laughs> Any other questions? And Nick, are you staying over lunch? Yes. Okay, so if, because I know one of the things that Health Literacy Missouri, you know, Nick was talking a lot about the regional piece. And so um, how, having lunch with Nick and talking about what, what are ways that we can work with, with Missouri in Nebraska? What are things, because there's, there's all this money. <laughs> That, you know, we all, I really like that the community-based participatory research concept. We're sitting around here at the table, we're the people doing the, the work in the state. What have we identified as things um, that we want to see happen? And I hope this happens whether you sit with Nick or whether you sit with each other at the table at lunch. What are things we want to see happen? Because we know. We, we don't need to go do another assessment. We already know. Three what's going on. So how can we all work together? That's another big outcome for this for this lunchtime piece. And and we can take it locally or, or regionally. So sitting with Nick is is taking this idea even bigger and working with Health Literacy Missouri, which is a foundation that exists to do this in their state and is looking to move to a regional. Level. Yeah, I might add that um, a big part of what Health Literacy Missouri is doing, the executive director is uh, and and uh, his associate director, um, who hired me when she was still at MU, she works directly for Health Literacy Missouri now. They, they've been working for a couple of years now on a coalition of states, too. I think Nebraska was represented at the last one. They, they're calling it Health Literacy USA. And, they're try, and every, there's a number of states that have well-developed health literacy interventions. Um, Iowa and Wisconsin, you might want to, you know, Google those those health literacy programs too. And if you Google health literacy Nebraska, you get there's some stuff there. There's some organized activity around it. So check it out. Okay. So that's um, I have something to say if you think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I have this. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about funding sources? Where do you look? Sure. Uh, governments, uh, grants.gov okay. is a good one. And then I think you can fine tune that search to health related or whatever you want. But, uh. Very good. Uh, are, are you on the, the, the blog? Do you get emails from me every day? I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to be on it. It's great. She's just advertising. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not already on the blog that I keep, uh, a big part of it is is funding, and it's based at the community. It's not library, it's community funding. So um, I keep a blog. I, you can either just go to the blog itself, or you can contact me, and I will send one email a day. I probably make about four entries, websites, and public health, um, AIDS information, just, I mean, it's just everything. But funding, it. I was hearing from people. You want us to do this stuff, but we don't have the money to do it. So funding is a big piece of I'm yeah. part of that. Oh, okay. you know, Liz, like, add people all the time. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, it's, it's great. It's wow. It's not spam. Not spam. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you said to read up Harris that goes out to the health department. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. really, really helpful. Okay. That's, 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 that's this. That's yeah. this? Oh, yeah. So that I don't need to sign. No, you don't need to Okay. Um, these are journal books, so what we want our people here to do is to think about ways you can partner with other people. And we honestly have a great representation here. We have state government, we have a public library, we have academia represented to a degree here, and a hospital librarian. So thank you so much for um, being our moderator, Anne. And to each of you, we hope that you will uh, work with the National Network Libraries of Medicine. Um, I'm going to make my first entry right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we like to see that. Oh, I have one more, too. And this one's for Terry, who will be co-presenting with me. Oh, wow. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So we hope all these I don't, ideas I don't have new cards around. yet. So we're going to take about a 15-minute break.